Okay, well, good afternoon. It's great to see everybody and uh, great to see the day going as it should. Exciting talks, a lot of interaction and great posters. Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Frank Gupton uh, for the first afternoon talk. Uh, Frank is at Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, he's the Floyd D. Uh, Gottwald Jr. Chair in Pharmaceutical Engineering. Uh, and his uh, kind of path in chemistry started in an interesting way uh, as an undergraduate student as the at the University of Richmond on a basketball scholarship. So that's great. Uh, he then got his master's degree uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, doctorate in chemistry at Virginia Commonwealth, uh, and started on a 31-year career in industry, uh, working in senior positions both at Herc Selenis and also Behringer uh, Ingelheim, and uh, did a lot of important work there that informed his uh, later chapter where he came back to VCU uh, in a faculty position in the engineering college and is really focused on, you know, developing uh, methods to produce pharmaceuticals for the broader world. Uh, his work uh, started an important uh, nonprofit, Medicines for All Institute, M for All. Uh, and it really has uh, the basis in a pretty simple idea, and that is how do you expand global access to life-saving medications by producing them more efficiently. Uh, this work has had a number of success successes, uh, including development of uh, a number of uh, paths for important therapeutics, and he's been well-recognized for that work. He's received uh, the Peter Dunn Award from the American Chemical Society, uh, that's for methods that could produce the anti-HIV drug uh, ne uh, nevirapine. And he's also been recognized with the ACS Green Chemistry Challenge Award and the ACS Award for Affordable Green Chemistry. And so we're excited to hear of this uh, journey from very sophisticated, heavy-duty chemical uh, companies to the work that you do now. So it's a real pleasure to be here to talk to you today, and I, I want to thank Scott for the opportunity to twist my arm one more time and uh, uh, join you to talk a little bit about, uh, as Milan was saying, about my journey in the uh, pharmaceutical sector and the chemical industry. And I think one of the things that really intrigued me when Scott um, asked me to come and give a talk today was about, um, let's see, about my journey to retirement. And so uh, the one thing that was really in intriguing about this, though, was, um, uh, as Milan was saying, I started out my career in 1976, and yes, I am older than Peter. Uh, and um, uh, I worked for Selenese. And for those of you who don't know, Camille and Henry Dreyfus were the ones that founded Selenese, and that's where they got their money to be able to fund the, uh, the foundation. So this becomes a really important uh, chapter in my life, but then... In 1993, I had the opportunity to, to become the uh, uh, North American Head of Process Development for Beringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals. Uh, Beringer Ingelheim is a really uh, interesting company. It's privately held by a family. It's about a $15 billion company, and they take a different approach to pharmaceuticals. They're much more long, longer term uh, in, their, in their planning process and their strategic operations. So uh, that was something that really intrigued me. And so I was there until 2007. So I'm from Virginia Beach, Virginia, and um, in 2006, I, I saw the opportunity where I could actually retire. So my wife and I started building a beach house, and uh, we finished it in 2007 in time to retire. But then um, I'd been retired maybe a little, almost a year, and I'd been on the advisory board at the engineering school at, at VCU, and the, and the dean of the humanities and sciences was an old friend of mine. And so they invited me to take a, a, a faculty position, uh, a joint appointment between chemistry and chemical engineering. My research groups were typically a 50-50 mix of chemists and chemical engineers, so I was very comfortable with that. So I've been there about a year, and this gets back to Peter's talk earlier today. And I got approached by the dean, and he said, uh, you know, you've managed large research groups before. He said, would you be willing to serve as our interim department chair? And after three tries... Uh, I finally agreed. I felt like I was going to get in trouble if I didn't accept it. 
So I've been there maybe a, a few years as, as, as the interim department chair. We got a new dean, and she said, you know, I'd really like to drop the, uh, the, the interim title. And I said, I'd much rather drop the chair title. And, and, uh, and, uh, and she twisted my arm kind of in the same way uh, that Scott did. And she, so I've been the, the department chair for a number of years now. But what was really interesting about uh, Andy's talk to, uh, this morning was um, I have a, 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 a great collaborator in Tim Jamison at MIT. And Tim called me. I was at, I was at um, lunch. And he called me and said, can you step out of lunch for a minute to talk to me? He said, I just got approached by the, by the faculty, and they've told me that I need to be the next department chair. And I said, he said, uh, he said, is there anything, any way I can get out of this? And I said, nope. I said, you're going to have to do this. And he said, well, have you got any advice for me? And I said, well, what I will say is that your job is to make everybody equally unhappy. And I think that that, uh, he called me a little bit later and he said, you know, that was, uh, that was probably the best advice he'd gotten because he'd done a really good job of that. Now, um, so I was, I was, I was at uh, a, a party before COVID hit with my wife, and my wife, I heard my wife say to one of my, fr my friends, she said, Frank was a complete failure when it came to retirement. And I think that uh, there's a lot of truth to that, but it's been, a, it's been a lot of fun, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So um, what I thought I'd start out with is to kind of show you the magnitude of the problem that we're faced with today. The, uh, uh, some colleagues of mine at DARPA gave me this um, uh, map, and this is our whole U.S. supply chain. Now, this is the part here. It's where uh, the pharmaceutical company plays a role. And everything below that are all transactional activities that take place between when the, when the drug leaves the, uh, uh, the, the pharma company and when it gets to the, pharma, uh, to the customer. So you can see all of these transactions that are taking place. So when you start looking at what we're, we're trying to do right now is we're trying to figure out how to streamline the portion of the process that's uh, uh, localized in the pharmaceutical sector and then minimize the amount of transactional activities that are taking place beyond the pharmaceutical company. So the other thing that, that had, um, uh, we, I've been interested in for some time was the last thing I did when I was in industry was to develop a process for this drug, Nevirapine, and it turned out to be one of the most widely prescribed HIV drugs, and it was used in all the combination drug therapies. And it gave me an idea about what the magnitude of the problem is with regards to HIV and other drugs uh, in the, on the African continent. I, I don't think we really understand the magnitude of the problem because we don't see it every day. But when you start looking at um, HIV, uh, these were actually, I think, 2016 numbers, 2019 numbers. Uh, there are over 35 million infected HIV patients globally, and almost all of them are located on the African continent. And there are about 2.1 million deaths per year of HIV, and I'll talk a little bit about the mode of those deaths in a second. But then you start looking at malaria. All the, almost all of the malaria cases are lo localized on the African continent. And then the other one that really shot me was this one about tuberculosis. I don't know if you all know much about TB, but um, there's a resistant strain of TB out there now that, um, that uh, doesn't, uh, none of the old drugs work on. And uh, there hasn't been a new drug in this space in probably 20 years. So uh, you've got this, all of this infection occurring on one continent. And then the other thing that the Gage Foundation pointed out to me is, is this, that this is where our population growth is going to be over the next decade. So you got this, you know, this, this recipe for disaster where all the infection and all the population growth is occurring in one, one location on the globe. And Africa, Africa gets all of its essential medicines from India and China. So they're totally dependent upon them. And one of my colleagues at the UN told me, he said between 50 and 70 percent of the, all the HIV drugs consumed on the African continent are either adulterated or counterfeit. And when you start thinking about over, underdosing an HIV patient, they end up building up resistance and they can't take the drug anymore. So this becomes a, a huge issue with regards to access to not only the quantity but the quality of the drugs that, that we're, we're, we're taking globally. So, um, so I wanted to take a step back and take a second about cost drivers. Why in the world did we decide to abrogate our responsibilities and have all these drugs manufactured in China, in India? There's, there are basically two reasons for that. One is an obvious reason, the other is not so obvious. So as you might guess, one is labor. So when you look at uh, this pie chart about 
uh, cost of manufacturing active ingredients in, in, in China and India, they're pretty similar, where all of that cost is being driven by the raw materials. Now, um, this is information that the Gates Foundation gave me, and they used a model compound uh, as a way of being able to calculate that, uh, and then uh, took five of them and then took the average of them. But it was pretty, it was all pretty tightly uh, uh, um, aligned with the, the, those two assumptions. Here's what it looks like in, in the United States and, when, and in Europe. You still have that same amount of raw material cost, but you've added a lot of overhead and labor costs to that cost. And that's the, one of the main drivers why we, we've chosen to move overseas. So there's another, but there's another reason. Uh, and, and that is waste. Pharma processes generate huge amounts of waste. Typically, uh, most pharma processes will generate several hundred kilograms of waste per kilogram of active ingredient. So when you start thinking about why is that and where is the, where's the opportunity, it's with solvents. So when you start looking at a, at a, a pharma manufacturing operation, this is what a, a, a typical API plant looks like, or active ingredient plant. You do your chemistry up on the fourth floor, you crystallize on the third floor, you centrifuge on the second floor, and then you dry the product on the first floor. So it's, everything's kind of gravity fed. So when you start thinking about it, about 50 to 70% of that reactor charge is in solvents. Then what happens? You, um, you uh, centrifuge, and most of that solvent goes out at the centrifuge, and then the rest of it comes out in the dryer. So the question is, um, this is where the major source of waste, process waste is. So you have to kind of ask yourself this question. Why do we isolate intermediates? So th this happens in every process step. So you've got a five-step synthesis. This is why you're generating so much waste in these processes. And, there, and the point is, the reason why we isolate intermediates is to purge impurities. And the reason why we're purging impurities is because we have inefficient chemistry. And so if we can develop better chemistry, then we can actually start to not only simplify the process and improve yields, but we can eliminate all these additional capital costs and intermediate isolations. So um, that is where the opportunity is that we see. And when you start looking at, uh, in summary, uh, all, you know, access to essential medicines is a global problem, and not just in the U.S., but it's been highlighted by the COVID epidemic, and it's really shined a light on it. And uh, one of the things I, I have always been concerned about is as Americans, we tend to have short memories. And after COVID uh, leaves us, uh, hopefully soon, we'll tend to revert back to our old practices and, re uh, and retain our vulnerability. I think that that's not going to happen this time, and there's a reason for that. I think that this whole international uh, upheaval in, in the Far East is going to create a constant problem with regards to supply chain access so bringing manufacturing of all types back to the United States has become a really important uh, aspect for the 21st century. The other part is that processes currently used to produce these APIs are, are a major source of environmental waste. And so uh, uh, in solvent uh, usage is the single largest contributor to that, to contributing to our carbon footprint. So I'll take a second and talk a little bit about what the Medicines for All Institute is doing. So what uh, our vision is to be a chain, global change agent for pharmaceutical process development. At the same time, what, what we're looking at it is from an end-to-end -end approach, looking at everything from starting materials all the way through to the, uh, 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 the finished dosage product. But we're, right now, our focus is mainly on uh, the active ingredient. But looking at uh, not only the chemistry, but the, the manufacturing platforms that are used to make these products. And then lastly, uh, our impact is... Uh, not only reducing treatment costs by securing the medical supply chain, but equally important, uh, using this as a training platform for the chemists and chemical engineers uh, to solve these problems in the 21st century. So um, uh, one of the things I want to talk about is uh, that's a principle that we use all the time in our laboratory. It's a thing called process intensification. And basically, process intensification is any process change that leads to substantially smaller, cleaner, safer, and more energy efficient technology. Now, uh, when you start looking at that, um, 
this is, uh, safety becomes a really important element of it, as well as energy usage, waste costs, and, the, and it's reducing the level of complexity in these processes. So how do we do that? We look at the chemistry first, and I mentioned that earlier. We also look at the equipment, and figuring out how we can produce these things more efficiently. When you start looking at pharma processes, we're really not using 20th century technology. We're using 19th century technology. It's basically round bottom flasks. And why is that? Okay, I'll, I'll confess to you, I'm an organic chemist and I'm chair of the chemical engineering department. And that doesn't make sense to a lot of people. But what I will say is this, that, that where these innovations are going to take place is right at the interface between those two disciplines. So having this unique opportunity puts us in, in a position where we can actually address some of these, these problems. But the, but, uh, the raw materials obviously is important. And waste minimization I, I mentioned earlier, and I'm not going to talk about this today, but catalysis becomes a really um, essential aspect to this. And we've developed some really amazing heterogeneous catalysts that we can use in packed beds for cross-coupling reactions and asymmetric reductions. So that gets back to kind of the basic science of what we're doing. But then how can we take that basic science and have a line of sight to be able to use it in uh, commercial operations? Uh, I don't know if you guys knew much, much about this, but about half of the new drugs that are in the marketplace, or they're, they're in development right now, use a cross-coupling reaction. And, um, and the problem is that, um, that these are all homogeneous catalysts, and they're typically using palladium. Palladium's toxic, and the drugs are really good ligands for the metals. So uh, you, have a, you, you run a reaction, you get 80 or 90 percent conversion, but then you end up spending three or four equivalents of reactor capacity to remove the metal from the react, that reaction mixture in order to be able to get down to the FDA standards for uh, uh, toxicity. So, and then by, that, by the time you've done that, you're down below a 50 percent isolated yield. And so this is a real challenge for us. If we can do these with pack bed heterogeneous catalysts, then we don't, we, have this, we don't have this issue about contamination. We don't see any leaching with these catalysts. So I'm, I'm not going to spend any more time talking about that, but it's some really cool work that we're doing right now in the group. And we have an NSF center grant on that. So um, these are about half of the new drugs that we worked on. But uh, uh, you can see that we've got a lot of HIV drugs. We've done all the first-line therapies. Uh, and we've also, on a project that we were working on with DARPA, we looked at uh, uh, any malarial drugs, any fungal drugs. And, uh, and most recently, we started working on uh, the um, COVID drugs. So what happened was, uh, I guess it was like February 2020, uh, the leadership at VCU told me, they said, we're shutting down all the labs. No, it, 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 um, no lab that uh, can be open that's not working on a, uh, on H uh, a COVID related project. So we had to shut down our labs for a period of time. So I called the Gates Foundation. They've been, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but they've been very generous. They've given us about $40 million to establish this institute. And I'll talk a little bit later about the payback on that $40 million. But I told them, I said, you know, we've got about 50 people standing around here because of COVID. I said, have you got any COVID related projects for us to work on? So we started out with um, remdesivir, and this um, uh, triazine here was really difficult to make, and they didn't think that they were going to be able to fix the supply chain on that. So we developed a whole new way of making that triazine from, uh, from um, acyclic precursors. Uh, and then uh, they, uh, they came back and they said, well, you did a good, such a good job on that. Why don't you start working on this new Merck drug, Molnupiravir? The cost of that drug initially was $5,000 a kilo. We cut it to two hundred. And, by, and, and, and we cut it from a, from a, a, a five-step, seven-step process to a two-step process, and uh, we made it from really cheap starting materials. Now, the Merck guys developed a second process, and theirs is about $500 a kilo, but the problem is they're using, um, they're not, we, we were using uh, a much more cost-effective building block to make the material from. Uh, we were using cytidine, and they were using uh, adenosine. And the adenosine had two problems. One, it was, it was about twice the cost of cytosine. And the other problem was that it was, there wasn't enough volume to be able to service the market. So, um, so I'm going to take a second and back up and kind of show you the impact of the work that we've been doing. This was the first drug that the Gates Foundation gave us to work on. They said, you know, you've worked on nevirapine before. You understand the process. We figured you'd probably know where the opportunities are for improvement. And I kind of held my breath because I said, well, yeah, I developed that process, and I thought it was actually pretty good. 
So uh, this was the first generation process that came out. And, and uh, the idea is to try and show you the number, the level of complexity uh, through the number of unit operations on this process and all the intermediates in the process. So we developed a second generation process once we realized that this was going to be a high volume drug. And it looked like this. And you can see we've reduced the level of com complexity dr uh, dramatically. But the gates, and so this was my benchmark for, for uh, where, we, where we needed to go with this process. This is what the new process looks like. So you think about it from the standpoint of going from here to here. Focusing on these processes and, and constraining the system becomes a really important aspect for success. And this is one of the things I was talking to the group about earlier, is um, if we have a big funnel and we give it to a graduate student or even a research chemist, they'll find all kinds of ways of doing stuff. So. But if you constrain the system and give them uh, uh, boundary conditions, so our boundary conditions are we won't accept anything less than a 90% conversion on any reaction. And then once we start doing that, we say, okay, now that you've done that, let's look at the next step and see if we can use the same solvent system on that so we don't have to do solvent exchanges. And that's how you can actually start to make a huge difference in the, in the carbon footprint on these systems. So uh, we, set, we, we set up a, a bunch of metrics for this to, to show the Gates Foundation, and they call this the Gupton chart. And it's basically looking at uh, overall process yield, PMI, which is a process mass intensity, which is the, uh, how much waste is generated per kilogram of product, and then the number of unit operations. So we improve the overall yield from 54% to about 94%. We reduce the number of unit operations by almost two, for more than two-thirds. But the really important thing was we took a, a process that wasn't generating as much waste as a lot of them that I've worked on. It was about 80 kilograms of waste, and we cut it to four. And it's by using these constraints to be able to force people to think differently about how you can produce these drugs more efficiently. So uh, as you probably know, Bill Gates is a pretty smart guy. And so unbeknownst to me, he started charting the cost of the drug in the marketplace. And you, uh, this is when we instituted the, the new process. And basically, the, 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 uh, the, the boundary condition from the Gates Foundation is we'll give you the money up front, but then you have to prov uh, uh, provide open access to all this technology. So we, we publish it. And then we published about right here. And then you started to see the drop in the cost of the drugs. So uh, when you start looking at that, um, we did all the first-line therapies and the annual savings that the Gates Foundation was getting out of this was about 85 to $90 million. So the, uh, off of a $39.4 million investment, which, which is a pretty good return on investment. But uh, uh, what it, it, it's deceiving that, that, um, that comment. And I just want to make sure you're clear, we're clear on this. This didn't give him more money. This allowed him to purchase more drugs with the same amount of money, which was the real advantage to this. So then um, COVID hit. And so um, we, uh, we were contacted by the federal government. And so we saw what you were doing with it, with, uh, through some connections that we'd already had in the marketplace and, and in government. They came to us and they said, we, we understand that you are, have been working on reducing the cost of, of a, uh, active ingredients. And when COVID hit, they said, we, we're going to have problems in sourcing a lot of these drugs that are coming out of China. So they asked, what would it, call, what would it take to re-onshore pharmaceutical manufacturing back in the United States? And I said, well, you're probably not going to like the answer because it's going to be expensive. But I got an idea. It was, uh, the VI facility in Virginia had been sold to another company out of California, Ampac, and, um, and they were idle. And they had a, big, a lot of acreage. So I said, what if we were to actually partner with Ampac and locate an API facility on the site? And we have another collaborator that I'll talk about a little later who does finished dosage formulation for the hospital systems. We'll put all that on one site, and we'd have an end-to-end -end system that we could do. And they said, well, how much would it cost? And I said, well, I'm just spitballing. It's probably about $300 million. This is like they came, they, they, it was a SWAT team that came to see us and, uh, uh, on a Saturday, and they said, well, okay, we'll get back to you on, on Monday. They called me 8 o'clock Monday morning. They said, it's gonna be, we're going to give you $360 million, and we got the money. Let's get started. So this is, this is that project. So then in parallel, we were talking with the Gates Foundation about this and uh, about the inability to be able to source drugs in, uh, uh, South, uh, in Africa. So what we, we, we started working with them in parallel, and we just completed the uh, scale-up of a, the first active ingredient produced on the African continent 
It's a, both an HIV drug and a drug to treat meningitis. So um, uh, we, we, we accomplished those two things. But then the other part of this, uh, uh, other than reducing the dependence on, off, uh, on offshore production, was transforming global health drug development. So um, I mentioned earlier the COVID drugs. Remdesivir, we didn't reduce the cost too much we, because we focused on that one building block. But myelinopiravir reduced the cost 92%. And near Metrelivir, we're actually working with Pfizer right now on, on the raw materials and with the Gates Foundation on the API steps. We've already reduced the cost of that 58%. We're hoping to get to 70% here very shortly. But then the, the other one was the TB drugs. So the Gates Foundation has, has developed a, a new regimen of, of four TB drugs. And the problem you have with TB drugs is if you're, if you're, if you're in low- and middle-income countries and you're a patient that's infected with tuberculosis, and they have a choice of taking a, a, an old drug that doesn't cost much, that doesn't work, versus a, a new drug that works but costs a lot of money, they'll pick the, the, the drug that costs less. So the idea is how do we, and most of that cost is associated with the active ingredients. So if we could develop a way of being able to reduce the cost of that, the active ingredients to be able to drive the cost down so that we can get uptake in the marketplace, that was something that could add value. So these are new drugs that are coming out now. And we've reduced those by over 67%. We're going to be able, I think we'll be able to get up above, uh, uh, up close to 80% by the time we're finished with all this. So these are my colleagues. Uh, this is my postdoc, Pere Tosa. And he introduced me to uh, uh, these two gentlemen who own CPT Pharma in uh, Pretoria, South Africa. And we are in the process of transferring that process, uh, completing the process of that, uh, that, that HIV drug to them. And then we're going to start setting up a network of, of um, formulators to be able to convert those APIs into finished dosage in other parts of the continent. So that's kind of the plan. Uh, the APIs are being produced down here, and the finished formulation work will take place on both sides of the African continent. And we're actually working with a lot of the global health agencies to make this a reality. So I put USP here first because I, t I didn't talk too much about product quality, but there have been many recalls that you all have heard about from drugs coming out of China. So one of the things we've done is we partnered with the U.S. Pharmacopeia, and they set all the quality standards for drugs uh, uh, internationally. And so they've co-located in our laboratories. And so they work with us to make sure that everything that we do meets uh, uh, U.S. standards for uh, 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 product uh, quality. So we work with USP. And then we, we look at these key starting materials as, uh, uh, as kind of what the, st the starting point for many of the, uh, of the processes. And then we take that information, develop a more efficient process. Then we transfer it to AMPAC over out in California. We're doing that right now. And AMPAC is um, a, a really great uh, partner for us. And I haven't talked too much about continuous processing, but that's the genesis of all the work that we're doing. Because when you, if you remember that pie chart that we had, there's two com major components to it if you're making it in the United States. One is raw materials and the other is raw material uh, uh, um, uh, labor. And so if we can automate these processes, reduce the labor and reduce the raw material costs, then we can start to become more competitive with the uh, um, uh, 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 global competition. So then we had to stand up a company. We called it Flow Corporation because it's continuous. And um, uh, that facility will produce the first five drugs uh, of essential drugs that the, the uh, um, uh, federal government has asked us to produce. And then we put the material into what we call the SAPR. It's a strategic API reserve. Previously, the federal government had been putting the finished dosage drugs into a reserve. And the, and the finished dosage drugs have a finite shelf life, and they're the more expensive. This is kind of the low cost point in the supply chain. So if we can store them there and rapidly convert them into the, the for, finished dosage, it saves money and also uh, extends the shelf life of the drugs. So Civica is our other partner on this. And this is a, an interesting story. Uh, a friend of mine, um, uh, um, Martin Van Triest, who was part of the leadership at Amgen, came to see me uh, prior to the uh, onset of uh, COVID. And we were talking about their problems that they were having with the hospital system. So um, Martin failed retirement pretty much the same way I did. And he was recruited to, to start this company. And it's basically a consortium of all the major hospitals in the United States. It's uh, Kaiser Permanente. It's uh, Mayo Clinic, Mass General, uh, Hopkins, all these hospitals, about 500 hospitals systems. They were, uh, they were 
they had lost anywhere between 10 to 20 percent of their operating room capacity because they couldn't get the drugs to support the procedures. So they felt like if they formed a consortium, they'd have enough critical mass to be able to purchase the drugs and formulate them on their own and eliminate all those intermediate uh, handoffs and reduce the cost at the same time. So Civic is building their own uh, injectable drug facility right adjacent to Flow. So all this will be done at one site. So um, then, uh, so uh, we're looking at we're looking at uh, all, oh, excuse me, I'll go, I'll go back a second. So uh, one of the real problem areas is with the children's hospitals. The volumes are low for the children's hospitals, but for reasons you might want to not think about, when, when uh, a patient, an emergency room patient comes into Children's National Hospital, they have to reformulate the drugs to be able to meet the individual infant's needs. And so uh, that takes time and it, and it adds a lot of cost to the process. So one of the things we're working on is developing a platform so that um, the, uh, um, the pharmacists can quickly formula, customize formulation of these drugs uh, to be able to meet their uh, acute needs. So then I guess it was about three months ago, um, we, had, we had been given a, a grant from the state to try and develop a, mat, a, a business plan for developing a national hub for advanced pharmaceutical manufacturing based on what we were doing down in Petersburg and what we were doing up in Richmond in our labs that were funded by the Gates Foundation. So um, we finished up that business plan and we, uh, 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 in September of last year, and then in October, I don't know if you all saw this or not, but there was this uh, RFP for the, these, uh, this uh, um, Build Back Better Grand Challenge. It was about a billion and a half dollars. And so we just took that business plan and tweaked it and submitted it. And there were 560 applicants for the job for that, and they cut it uh, for phase one uh, evaluation. We made it through the first cut, uh, and there were 60 finalists. And I was on my way back to the beach house on a Thursday evening, and um, I got a call, and they said we're one of the 20 recipients, and we received a hundred million dollars to be able to build this 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 hub. But what was interesting was I got home and, I, and they told me, they said, you have to be back in Richmond because we're going to have a press conference on it. So I came back. Uh, so I told my wife and she said, well, you don't have a white shirt. She said, yeah, I got to go out and buy you a white shirt and a tie. So uh, the next morning I show up at the biotech park and they're all, everybody's sitting there. They said, you need to sit here. And I said, why? This is just a press conference. She said, no, this is a press conference with the president of the United States. He's going to be announcing all this stuff. So I had no idea that I, what I was walking into. So uh, that's the Build Back Better Alliance, uh, uh, the Alliance for Building Better Medicines, which was funded through the uh, federal government. So um, I'll, I'll just close by kind of showing where we started, and that was enhancing uh, access to essential medicines for patients around the world. And we start looking at, at that, the aspects of that. You know, we developed all these low-cost syntheses. Uh, and this issue about training the next generation of chemists and engineers you know, our, 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 our chemists and engineers have a really high vapor pressure. They get hired before I can get them to finish their theses. And uh, it's because we're training them differently. They're thinking about these problems holistically. They're not just chemists. They're not just engineers. They're chemists and engineers working together to solve a problem. And then uh, this whole idea about continuous manufacturing platforms becomes that enabling capability that will allow us to be able to be competitive on a global basis. and uh, address this whole supply chain issue. And then this commodity-based processing, looking at it from the standpoint of simple building blocks, uh, we, were to, uh, uh, we were talking earlier about how to, how to use retrosynthetic an analysis tools and AI to be able to, to do this more effectively. But then the last thing about this greener synthesis will allow us to be able to, in good conscience, transfer these processes anywhere in the world to people that need them without creating another bigger carbon footprint. So with that, I'd like to uh, close by giving you a few thoughts from a, a habitual collaborator. And the first thing I would say is, know what you know and know what you don't know. And uh, the second one is, seek help from those who know what you don't know. And David, this was a, your, your talk today was really meaningful and impactful to me because these catalysts that we were working on, uh, we didn't understand how they worked. So I partnered with a, 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 a colleague of mine in the physics department who was doing DFT calculations. And what they didn't give us the exact answer, but what they did was they provided us with a platform to get a more fundamental understanding to, to decide 
what experiments needed to be done to be able to get orthogonal validation of our assumptions. And we did that, and it really did uh, change uh, our, our whole perspective on, on cat catalysis uh, uh, preparation. And then also the other idea is look for the win-win in all cases. And lastly, and probably equally important, is share the recognition and money helps. Money is a great lubricator for collaborations. And I think that that's one of the things we've been very successful at. But uh, the other thing I, I, I preach to our students that elegance is simplicity. Uh, I, I think that you know the challenging aspect of what you all are faced with as young investigators is the system that's out there that's been designed to allow you to get tenure. And so what, what you're looking at is how do you publish? How do you get funding? And part of, the, uh, part of the problem you have with that is you have to do something real elegant. In, uh, I had a good boss uh, early in my career when I was at Southern He pulled me aside and he said, Frank, you're coming from academia. He said, remember, in, in academia, elegance is complexity. In the industry, elegance is simplicity. So, you know, be counterintuitive when it comes to doing the work that you're doing here. And I, you know, I applaud that. The other thing I would say, look for non-traditional funding opportunities. Because I, you know, I was initially shunned by a lot of my colleagues because I wasn't getting NIH or NSF funding. What I found out was the, the funding that I was getting was much more impactful when it came to changing how people live. And, and that's what you really should be kind of the way you think about the work that you're doing, whether it's in basic science or applied science. So with that, I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today and be glad to answer any questions.